So, 10 years of progress in the MBCD field. The topic of non-biological complex drugs has been discussed for about 10 years within the Clinum family. And it has brought us quite some impact into uh, the different systems in regulatory innovation, in draft guidance documents, but also in collaborations between different types of parties. So this all started about you know, 12, 13 years ago on a workshop hosted by the Dutch Top Institute Pharma, where we discussed the bioequivalence of complex drugs. We brought together a community of industry professionals, regulatory scientists, regulatory agencies, academics, and that led to a paper published in 2011 on the therapeutic equivalence of complex drugs. Well, that led to quite some further discussions, and it initiated um, a working group that decided we need to pick up on this topic and continue discussions because there's so much more that needs to be clarified and needs to be entertained to actually have a science-based approval and post-approval standards for these type of products. So it's a collaboration of over 10 years with many different experts all over the world. Some of them are, are listed here. It's being convened by Ligature, the foundation I work for, a non-profit organization based in the Netherlands. And uh, all the partners provided input with their own hours. Uh, and uh, some of the industry partners provided uh, a bit of funding to uh, have the meetings, to do the logistics and the organization. So when we got together, we mentioned to each other, well, we first need to figure out what the issues are related to complex drug products. And I'll, we'll come to the definition of complex drug products later. Because only when we have the issues and we have clarified those issues, we can have interactions with the different types of scientists all over the different uh, countries, the different regions in the world, and from industry, academia, and regulatory agencies. And based on those scientific discussions, it was our ambition to inform policy because it was our belief and our observation that sometimes certain documents were launched and we thought, well, maybe, you know, if we would had uh, in-depth scientific discussions, maybe they would have looked in a different way. So that was the ambition we set out 10 years ago. And we followed the path of creating awareness within science an understanding of the regulation, and we hoped, of course, that we could achieve alignment in practice. So all the way from basic research, regulatory innovation towards uh, uh, practitioners uh, in hospitals, in uh, GPs, to make sure that everyone has a common understanding of the complexity of the products. It started off with figuring out what are we actually talking about. And uh, we have seen it today already. There are a number of different definitions of certain terms. Um, and, and you notice I have a strong Dutch accent. Uh, you will notice Scott has an American accent. Uh, you will also notice Marianne has a very sophisticated British accent. Uh, and, and that can all lead to very interesting discussions. But when you read things, you hope that we all have the same understanding of the words on paper. Well, in fact, that's not the case, because if you have a different background, whether you're a fundamental scientist, whether you are a clinician, whether you're a uh, legislator or a lawyer, you may have a different interpretation of those terms. So within this starting paper, we try to set out, and the text says it, to make sure that we have a same starting point of the discussion. And that led to quite some interactions with the community, also based on um, um, uh, questions we asked. Well, how would you define this, this, and this? So we defined a non-biological complex drugs uh, about nine or 10 years ago, uh, really to give a kickstart to the discussion. Because if you define it, and we can have a discussion whether it's the right definition or not, at least you start the discussions. And we landed on this one to make sure that it's attributed to the complexity of this product. It's a synthetic medicinal product. It's not a biological medicine. It has an active substance that is not homomolecular, but contains different closely related and often nanoparticulate structures. And that's why nanomedicines are per definition part of this family. It cannot be fully characterized by physical, chemical, analytical means, and the robust manufacturing process is fundamental to ensure quality, safety, and efficacy. And a number of examples are listed on the slide. There are many others, of course, that, that fall under this definition, but that led to the start of the discussions. Now, why is this an issue? It's not an issue per definition for 
innovative products. But it is an issue for those products that are off patent or are being modified in terms of formulation as a follow-on product. So for small molecule drugs, we have a very well working system for generic drug products where we established pharmaceutical equivalents, bioequivalents, and that leads to therapeutic equivalents. We have developed together in the world, and Europe was uh, first in this, the biosimilar approach, where we can really introduce biosimilar products of high quality that are similar to the originator. 10 years ago, when we started this discussion, it was unclear how we would treat these complex drug products. Are they part of the generic paradigm? Are they part of the scientific approaches to establish similarity? And now 10 years later, I think it's much more clear. We see Europe, we see the US putting policies in place to deal with the complexity of this product. And I think that's, I cannot claim that that has happened due to uh, the, the working group, but I think we have contributed to the discussion. So we've seen uh, a number of agencies, and there are many of the agencies are here actually for the IPRP, um, have developed um, regulatory guidance and draft guidance on complex drug products. Uh, typically, there's a, a time for uh, public consultation, so you can provide input to such guidances. We have done that for a number of agencies in order to make sure that what we believe is the scientific rationale um, for these guidelines is implemented. So, although the terminology around the world is still not aligned, it becomes more clearer, the situation. So in Europe, we define hybrid medicines, those that uh, is not a specific generic medicine, but is slightly different strength, different route of administration, and different indication than the reference medicine. So you would almost say this is a complex generic. And that's exactly how the FDA defines complex drug products, follow-ons, complex generic products. Our products defined with complex API, complex formulation, complex route of delivery, and a complex dosage form. So in terms of science, we're getting closer to each other. Terminology is a different thing. But I think if we look back where we came from, this is already quite a, quite significant progress. And then last year, um, two years ago actually, uh, the EMA and the FDA, they launched a pilot to have a parallel scientific advice for hybrid slash complex generic projects. So if a sponsor is developing such a complex follow-on product, he could ask for parallel scientific advice at both of the agencies. And hopefully that in the end, of course, will lead to some sort of harmonization or at least uh, regulation that yeah, shows that approval in one may also lead to approval in the other. So we have a, a bit of hope that this will help the community to work towards approvals of these products and have a consistent response from agencies and not that the FDA is saying something different than EMA. Well, there's another thing happening and, and you may be aware, you may not be aware, but this is the open discussion in Europe. So there is a proposal to revise the EU pharmaceutical legislation. I think it's one in you know, a career lifetime that this opens up for, for discussion. And there's a proposal on the table currently at the European Parliament and the Council based for a, a new directive to regulate medicinal products and also uh, a, a, a regulation itself for the authorization of medicinal products. And if you go through it, it changes a significant part of the processes we're currently used to on how drug products are going to be approved. So I went through the documents, uh, quite a lot of pages. Uh, the, the, the main page is uh, 180, and even if you have an annex of 103 pages, you're pretty sure that there's a lot of information in there. Uh, but what's not in there, if you search it, nanomedicine. It's not part of the legislation. It's not part of the directive. So even after all those efforts of this community, it's not a legal definition. So nanomedicines from the point of the regulator and the legislator is not a defined term. So that's something to keep in mind. If we talk to the regulatory agencies, if we talk to the legislators, they don't have a box to put this in. So we need to help them to understand where we are in the process. Isn't there anything that is relevant to this discussion? Yes, there is. 
complex medicinal products. They're explicitly mentioned in the documents. And um, I was actually pretty excited when I read these parts because we always had a feeling that in Europe, the complexity of these medicinal products uh, warrants a centralized EMA approach because the complexity of the products, you cannot expect every agency in Europe to have all the scientific knowledge, all the skill sets to value and to, to uh, regulate uh, and approve these products. So there are some paragraphs in the documentation that says we acknowledge this complexity, we need to build expertise in these new areas, and we have had limited capacity and limited appropriate expertise on this complex medicinal product. So the acknowledgement of that and the intention to build educational activities around these topics for the individual regulators, I think is a, is a very good step. So what is the impact of the currently proposed directive and regulation on the approval of complex drug products? If nothing is changing in the next two weeks, because there's two weeks open for comments, then this is what will happen. All new submissions for marketing approval of new medicinal products will have to go through the AMA centralized procedure. So currently, you can choose whether you go to a national agency or decentralized or mutual recognition. That's all off the table. So all new products will have to go through AMA. That's a significant difference than we're currently seeing because only for oncology products, for biotech products, for ATMPs and a few others, you now have to go through AMA. You can go through the countries for all others. So this is a significant change. Another change, in addition to the generic, the hybrid, and the biosimilar pathway, there will be a new pathway installed, the biohybrid pathway. And that kind of you know, leads to a more balanced uh, structure that they mimic the biohybrids towards the current hybrid pathway. So it gives more flexibility for complex product developers in the biological space to have their products um, uh, approved based on uh, reference uh, products. The third one, all the hybrids, biosimilar biohybrids, will have to go through mandatory centralized AMA procedures. So also for the follow-ons, the generics of these uh, complex ones, you need to go through AMA. However, the simple generics, these are optional. So a sponsor can still go through the individual countries. And for me, that is an area that, that is a bit of a gray area. Because in the end, who decides whether a product is a simple generic or a hybrid? Is that a national decision or will it go to AMA? And we've seen applications over the past 10 years of a sponsor of a complex product trying to go through a 10-1 generic one, and the agency said, well, okay, thank you, but we believe you should file a 10-3 and add more information to the dossier. Well, there now may be some sort of incentive that the national agencies may not make that move because it also means that they have to hand off the dossier to the EMA. And I don't know what the politics are behind that, but that's an interesting gray area for me that I would still like to explore. So a lot has happened over the last 10 years. I think we're in a very special moment in time now where you know, things can still change in a couple of weeks, but it will have an impact on how this community will be able to develop their products. Because many of the nano formulations, and I'm sure Scott will come to that point, are of course formulations of already existing uh, APIs. And those would go through the hybrid pathway most often. So the, it has an impact on the innovative things that we are doing here, trying to get that approved into a drug product. Well, uh, I hope that I've showed you that you know through all of these different types of activities, we were able to generate some impact. Over the past years, we have been publishing quite a lot of papers, uh, even a book on MBCDs. So there's a lot of reference that everyone can, can look into. And this could have never been possible, uh, first of all, without Klinam, because we always convened here. It was very nice. You even see the picture on the conference center in Basel uh, with the key people here. Uh, some of you will speak today, uh, but it has really led to a number of key achievements.